Uh, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Sung Park. I teach photojournalism and multimedia at the School of Journalism and Communications. Uh, it's great to be here. Great to see all of you here. Um, this is my first year here at uh, U of O, and it, I'm having a great time so far. Uh, we have a very special guest today. Uh, but first, let me tell you about um, the Fraser Journalist in Residence um, program. Uh, uh, Robert B. Frazier was um, former editorial page editor for the Register Guard. He was described as the complete newspaper man. He excelled as a reporter, feature writer, editor, and columnist. And in 1992, um, he endowed, or the family endowed, uh, a scholar, no, it was a, um, the endowment fund was established, sorry. The endowment fund was established uh, to bring in uh, working journalists to share their experience and their expertise. So today, uh, we have Gabriel Dance. Uh, Gabriel's originally from Colorado. Uh, he's currently living in New York City, and he's working at the, um, the Daily, which is the first um, online newspaper exclusively for the iPad. And uh, previously, uh, Gabriel worked at the New York Times as chief multimedia producer. He was there for about five years. Um, five years? Yeah. Five years. Uh, before that, he went to grad school at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, studied uh, multimedia journalism there. Uh, previously, he was at Colorado State, Colorado State, Colorado State uh, where he studied computer science and journalism. Um, so he has both print and online experience, uh, specializes in multimedia interactive and graphics. Uh, but also enjoys photography. So um, I'm really happy to introduce Gabriel Dance. Uh, Sung, I don't know if my, my room on? mic is on. I got a couple mics here. <laughs> How's that? Is that yeah. on now? Yeah, I think so. That's, That's working? Good. Yeah. Okay. Can everybody hear me? For the most part, sure. I got a pretty loud voice, so we can probably make it work either way. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be in Oregon. My little sister graduated uh, from this very university maybe a year ago, so I've been a Duck fan for about five years, and uh, I'm happy to be back in the Northwest. I'm happy to be back on the West Coast, that's for sure. It's uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. The weather's nice, so thanks for giving me that gift as well. <laughs> New York's been a real bear lately, and uh, so I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to start out, and I'm going to talk for maybe about an hour, and then open it up, and really, I'm really interested to know what you guys are curious about. And uh, I remember when I was in undergrad and, and grad school, I was always very curious about how newsrooms worked, how I could get in a newsroom, what jobs were available, what projects worked on, how, how it all works. And so uh, I'm happy to answer all of those questions for you. Um, most of my talk's going to center around the New York Times and the work I've done there over the past five years. I did take a new job as art director for news at The Daily in December, and so I'm happy to talk about that as well, and maybe we'll get into that uh, during the questions and, and that kind of stuff. Sung and I tried to hook our iPads up to the projector, but it doesn't look like that's going to work, so uh, probably no iPad demonstration, but uh, I am happy to, to chat about that stuff. So anyways, I'll, I'll get into it, and uh, I'm going to give a little background and stuff like that, but in an hour or so, uh, I'll open up for questions, and you guys can ask me really anything you want to. Uh, as Sung mentioned, I grew up in Colorado, and I went to Colorado State University for undergrad. When I first got to Colorado State University, I've always been extremely interested in computers. And so I, you know, day one knew that I wanted to do computer science and program and, and create. Like, I really like building things. I really like making things. I really like being able to see things on the web. And, and I've always been kind of a computer nerd. And the reason why I bring that up is because, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of confusion, I think, in uh, J schools 
and in the journalism environment as a whole as to what do I have to do to become a journalist nowadays? Do I have to know Flash? Do I have to be able to program? Do I have to do HTML5? Do I have to do JavaScript, et cetera, those kinds of things? Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more as I go on. But the answer to that is no. Like you don't have to do those things to be a journalist nowadays. To be a journalist of the same type I am, the answer is yes. Um, but there's a lot of different types of journalists, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about some. Uh, but I bring that up because you guys should know that I was interested in computers at, th at the same time I was interested in journalism. And if you're not innately interested in computers in the way that I am, you really shouldn't sign up to try to be the same exact type of journalist that I am. Like if you don't, and I'll come back to this point throughout my, throughout my talk, but if you don't enjoy or have an interest in computers or let's say 3D or video or photography, then it's not very likely that you're going to be extremely successful at any of those individual things. Like you should really, decide what you're interested in, whether it's photography or writing or audio or narrative storytelling or programming or doing those kinds of things, and then take those skills and apply them to journalism and really go for the things that interest you. And so again, I'll, I'll come back to that, but so I, I, I got my computer science degree and then by my junior year of college when I was finishing that up, I, I kind of realized that computers for me were much more of a hobby than they were what I actually wanted to do as a job. I was interested in computers, but I didn't want to go out and build operating systems. I didn't want to go out and work for a company building some kind of application. I really wanted to uh, communicate and tell stories and do that kind of stuff. And so I started a second major in journalism. And originally, I was just writing. I was writing for my school newspaper. Um, I'm not sure if any of you here do that, but I highly encourage it. It was a great experience. Uh, another theme I'll come back to over and over is doing what it takes to kind of get your foot in the door. Um, so I, 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 got my, I started my journalism major, and the Colorado State newspaper is called The Collegian, and it's about a 10,000 circulation daily, uh, five days a week. And uh, so an, a decent sized college newspaper. And when I first started my major, I really wanted to get a job there. And the only job they had available was layout and pagination. And this wasn't even like the fun kind of layout. This wasn't doing design. This was basically putting advertisements on the pages every single night and uh, going through and making sure that the pages were numbered correctly. And, and it, was a, it, was, it was a dull and it was a rote job, but it got me into the newspaper. And so after I was doing that for a couple weeks, a couple months actually, I was making friends with uh, all the different editors, and, and so the entertainment editor was uh, a friend of mine by that point, and she said that uh, Fife Dog was coming to town. I don't know how many of you are familiar with a tribe called Quest, uh, the old hip-hop group, but Fife Dog was coming to town and nobody was covering it. And I said, well, would it be okay if I covered it? You know, I love a tribe called Quest. They were a really influential group. Um, if you're not covering it, I'd be happy to go out there and, and, and cover the show and do an interview. And so she said, sure. And so that was really, it ended up being a full front page spread in full color with a Q&A with Fife Dog. And we got into like all their time um, starting the hip hop and, and pioneering a whole, you know, generation of music. And it kind of like gave me the bug. And it really kind of, I, I was excited not only to see a byline, but to see an interview I had done. And, and from there on out, um, I was very excited to continue being a journalist and, and to do those kinds of things. Uh, and, and like I said, I'll come back to that, but, but part of my point for you guys is you do what you got to do to get your foot in the door wherever you want to be. And you try to put yourself in the best position to succeed, um, even if you're not exactly sure what you want to do in the end. You should constantly be trying to put yourself in the best possible position for where you think you might be going. So I started writing, and then I, and then I decided, oh, I'm going to throw away my, my computer. I don't care about computers anymore. I'm just going to write. Uh, I started writing editorials for them. I was having a really good time. I graduated, and I said, oh, man, what am I going to do? 
And there are a couple options, just like there will be uh, several options for you all. One is to try to apply at a small local newspaper, maybe cover the courts, maybe cover local government, maybe cover the, uh, the, the local sports, doing those kinds of things. Um, you could try to apply at bigger newspapers, although it's unlikely unless you have a lot of clips that you're going to necessarily get your foot in the door right away at one of those. Um, and for me, another option was grad school. Uh, I hadn't done, because I picked up my journalism degree kind of late in undergrad, I decided that I really wanted to work on my writing some more, to try to really work on my reporting especially, to hone my skills a little bit more. And so I applied to a bunch of graduate schools and uh, ended up going to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And the honest reason I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is because they have a full ride fellowship called the Roy Park Fellowship. And it was really, I mean, it really did come back down to that. There was that, there was Northwestern, which is a wonderful school, the Medill School, Missouri, Berkeley, but all of them were quite expensive. And Carolina was going to be free, so I went to Carolina. And uh, it just so happened that it, at Carolina in 2004, when I went there, uh, a guy named Rich Beckman was there, and he was way out ahead of the multimedia game. <coughs> And when I went there, I had never even heard of multimedia journalism. I was going there to write. I was just going to write. But I showed up, and, and I think they kind of had an idea of what they wanted to do with me, regardless of what I had an idea. But Rich said, you know, why don't you come down and, and see some of the stuff that we're working on? And, and it was really fantastic. You know, there was audio slideshows, and they were working on video, even though, like, broadband wasn't quite as ubiquitous as it is today, and, and uh, interactive graphics. And, and I had heard about, I'd, I'd seen Flash on the internet, I had done a little bit with Flash, but really, right as I showed up, ActionScript 3 was released, and Flash had kind of hit this next level, and you were able to really start doing um, high-level computations, the processing speed had really sped up. So Flash had really taken this big leap forward. And for me as a programmer, picking up Flash was extremely easy. And so I was way out ahead of the game all of a sudden in Flash, and I remembered how much I liked creating stuff. And Flash made it really, really easy for me to really quickly put something together and get it up on the internet and say, look, that's live, that's real. Um, I really enjoyed doing that stuff. And so all of a sudden I got swept up in doing these multimedia projects at, at Carolina, and it also gave me the opportunity to kind of travel and do other kinds of things. So. Um, I'll pull up one example. <laughs> uh, my, this is my senior, or er, not my senior, but my thesis that I did while I was there. And this is uh, called Chasing Crusoe. It's about an island that's 400 miles off the coast of Chile. And uh, it's a very small island where lobster fishing, and, and it's a very like, separated island from the rest of Chile, and, and, and basically from the rest of the world. You'll notice that. Just last year, we came back through the tsunami, uh, the, the massive earthquake that struck Chile. Um, I can't remember exactly when it was, uh, but about a year ago, created a huge tsunami that then went and basically washed out Robinson Crusoe Island. And it was really sad, and it kind of like tore away all the stuff that was there during that time. So that's why this page uh, looks like that right now. But let me take you into the site and show you a little bit about what we were doing. Preloaders, you guys remember those. Over 300 years ago, in 1704, a discontented sailor marooned himself on an uninhabited rocky island more than 400 miles off the coast of what is now Chile in the Pacific Ocean. Today, that isolated chunk of land is known as Robinson Crusoe Island. The sailor, a Scotsman named Alexander Selkirk, distrusted his English captain and his infested, rotting, and leaky ship. Selkirk expected a swift rescue by a friendly passing boat, but it was four long years and four months before a British vessel finally saved Selkirk from his chosen fate. Pirates, privateers, and other explorers were familiar with the island on which Selkirk marooned himself. It was an island oasis that offered... 
So as you can see, it's uh, it's uh, the the whole site is kind of concerned with discussing this island that was the uh, the basis for the the story Robinson Crusoe, and we compare and contrast what the island was like with what Defoe wrote in his novel, and you'll see many things. And, and remember, this was uh, early 2006. You'll see many things that look uh, very similar to what you might see on the New York Times today, such as uh, 3D, 1659, infographics. So a 27-year-old Englishman is living in Brazil. His wanderlust has led him on sailing adventures around the world, and the prospect of further adventure easily lures him back to sea. Along with 13 other men, Crusoe sets sail on an illegal slave trade expedition in New Guinea. They are headed north along the Brazilian coast. So as you can see, we, we were doing animated infographics. We were explaining things. You'll see here, uh, I think this isn't the right one. This might be, I don't know. Yeah, no, this is the right one. So step-by-step uh, -step infographics, which you guys probably see quite a bit on uh, in the New York Times, on the Washington Post, on MSN, on et cetera, a lot of them. But at the time, the New York Times and, and those sites weren't, boy, oh, those rocks really roll for a while, huh? They, we weren't doing, the New York Times and them, they weren't doing these kinds of things at the time. And so I also bring that up because I'd like to encourage college students and university students, whether you're grad school level, undergraduate level, to do as much e experimentation and innovation right now as you can. Because once you get into, I don't want to call it the real world because you're in the real world, but once you start working all the time, the bottom line ultimately at most of these companies is getting the product out and money. And so it's really hard to innovate and convince them to spend money on innovation if you can't convince them how they're going to make money off this. So you don't have that problem generally while you're in the university level. And that's really what ended up getting me my job at the New York Times. I went right from this project and I started at the New York Times about two months later. And uh, it was really the fact that we were pushing the boundaries, that we were doing things that they couldn't, that at the time they couldn't spend the time figuring out how to do those things. Like they had, we had to go in there and show them this is how you do it, this is how you do it, this is how you make 3D graphics, this is how you pair them with audio. You know, there was all these different kind of mediums that we were working with. Um, let me go back to this real quick. So as I said, I was hired by uh, the New York Times in 2006, and they hired me for a variety of things. Uh, I, while I was at North Carolina, I took audio editing classes, I took photography classes, videography classes. I continued to work on my programming. I developed, uh, I worked with Ruby, PHP, ActionScript, JavaScript, etc. cetera. Um, and I worked a lot on project management, which is actually a very real skill. And by project management, I mean, understanding what all these different people are doing and then putting those skills into uh, being able to coordinate with, let's say, the graphics person and the writer and the photographer and having a vision for what you want the final product to be and going through and creating those things, which is a good leap into the next part of what I wanted to talk to you guys about, which is jobs in the newsroom. And uh, the reason why I want to go through jobs in the newsroom with you guys is to give you an idea of the wide variety of different types of journalism jobs that are available to you. Because I think a lot of people get stuck thinking, I can be a reporter, or I can be a flash HTML developer, or I can be a videographer or a photographer. And there's actually many more jobs available to you than that. And so, so I'll talk about some of them. Obviously, all of your jobs um, well, in journalism are going to start with an editor. And whether that's an executive editor, whether that's a desk editor, um, a department editor, a graphics editor, and, and th their job is to make sure the content's accurate and correct. Um, usually they have quite a bit of experience. You don't come in at an editor level. Uh, and they have a top level view of the project. They're the ones making sure that the direction of your project is correct, that you're answering the questions that they want you to answer, that you're uh, making sure that you hit the points that they think that you should be hitting for it. Um, you obviously have reporters, too. And reporting is something that I think we should talk about for a little bit of time, because reporting 
is distinct from writing or from taking photographs or from programming. Reporting in itself is an incredible skill that all of you guys should be striving to really develop in yourselves. Um, the ability to go out to find a story, to find out what the lead of that story is, to develop contacts, to make sure that you know how to work with those contacts, to be able to report at a level where you're getting your facts right, where you can come back to your boss and they say, oh, well, what is this? And you have an answer for them. Proper note taking, the ability to record your things if you want. But there's, there's, a le there's two levels, uh, there's multiple levels of, of journalists at the New York Times, but the people who are on that top, top level, they're the best reporters. They're the investigative reporters. They're the political reporters. They're the people who know how to go out, find a story, and report that story, to develop their contacts, to follow leads, to say, mm, that doesn't really sound right when somebody feeds them a line, to go deeper, to work around it. So, and I think that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle of skills. Uh, writing is a skill. Taking photographs is a skill. Programming is a skill. All of those things are skills. But reporting is the fundamental basis of being a journalist. And so if you guys don't feel like you're getting out there and doing enough really like hard reporting, figuring out, asking questions, finding a lead, teasing out stories, then I really encourage you to do that. And that's why writing for the paper can work. Maybe you write a blog about something that you're particularly interested in here in Eugene. Maybe you cover uh, a local sports team or a high school sports team. But really, like, really flexing your reporting chops could really, like, lend you that next level of, that, will, that will then provide you with the content you need to tell wonderful stories. Um, so every story at the New York Times, you know, ha has reporters on it. They gather content. They're the most familiar person with the story. Uh, they often have a, a, a message or an angle that they're seeking. And, and, but what's really important is that as a, if you're not the reporter yourself, and, and oftentimes I wasn't doing the reporting myself, is that I work extremely closely with the reporter to make sure they know what I need them to get to complement their story with multimedia. So that means making sure that when a reporter goes out and they're going to have a really important interview, let's say, with the mayor of New York City or the, or the mayor of Eugene or the coach of the basketball team, that you've spoken with them prior to them doing that and have either provided them with, let's say, an audio recorder or you're making sure the photographer is going with them. But you have some kind of concept of what kind of full package you want to come out of this, and then you're able to work with the reporter to make sure that they come back and are providing you with the content you need. Because if you don't, a lot of times what goes on in reporting is there's only one time that they, there's only one time that you get to first ask a question and get the response back from somebody. If you have to go and say, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't bring my audio recorder, and you come back a day later and ask that question, you're not going to get the same response that you got from them the first time. Like it's really, really important that you work closely with your reporters and that together with them you have a vision of what you're trying to produce. Let me get off that page. Uh, so reporting uh, is an incredibly interesting and important role in the entire process. Uh, photography and videography. That is uh, a really hard job to get into. There are a lot of photographers, there are a lot of videographers. And so again, one of the places that you can really separate yourself if you're interested in those positions is your reporting. Like if you're able to get into certain situations, if you're fearless, if you have not only beautiful shots, but you're in the right spot at the right time because you knew where to be, that's how you're going to separate yourself. There's a lot of people out there who can shoot pretty, pretty pictures. There really is. There's a lot of people out there who can shoot high quality video. But if you're in the right spot at the right time and you can shoot a high quality, gorgeous photo, then you've got to step up on everybody else. Um, an example of some really high quality uh, photography and, oh, I'm sorry. work is a project called One in Eight Million at the New York Times. Some of you guys might be familiar with this, but the reason why I bring up One in Eight Million is that this is a really great example of reporters and photographers working together. And so the, I, the concept behind One in Eight Million is 
people went out, there are 8 million people living in New York City, and this series, once a week, did an audio slideshow uh, discussing one of many numerous characters around the city. But what's really interesting is how these got put together. And the story behind that is multimedia producers at the New York Times would pitch uh, a character to uh, the editor and say, let's say it's uh, um, you know, any, of, any of these million sports people, only childs, clerks, dancers, just really interesting little stories. Then they would go out and they would report these stories, but they would not only report them taking notes, doing that stuff, but audio. They would record all of these. They would make sure the quality was extremely high. Then they would do close collaboration with Todd Heisler, the photographer, and they would say, Todd, here's the story. Here's what we're working on. And so Todd knew what he needed to shoot to complement their stories. And so I spoke with some people a little early about this, that not, al not always does the photographer and the reporter need to be there at the same time. Oftentimes, you can go and report the story and then have the photographer come back. Obviously, that doesn't work on breaking news. Breaking news, it's all hands on deck. Everybody's there at the same time. But this is just an example of how you can work with the photographer to make sure. I have no idea which one I just chose. But uh, let's see. Some of these are really good. I'm trying to find one that, uh, okay, so this one's interesting. You were a great teacher, even as a learning thing to in the United States, I met uh, my husband, Joe, he was a great teacher, So that's kind of, a, I probably shouldn't have chosen one where the woman had a very heavy accent, but uh, I didn't remember that. But that's just an example of like photography and, and multimedia working together. Like no longer is, Todd Heisler won a Pulitzer Prize in Denver for his coverage of uh, the Columbine attacks. Uh, actually might have been for the fire on Storm King Mountain. But anyways, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer who's being asked to work in conjunction with multimedia people to put together these narrative story pieces and this narrative storytelling. And so that's the next kind of like uh, person I want to talk about, which is the narrative storyteller, which is a lot of what I see going on in Sung's classes and classes around, around um, campuses around the country. And that's the idea of being able to tell a story, right? The fundamental idea of being a journalist is that you're telling a story and somehow informing or putting into context news or interesting things to help people understand something in a greater context. Uh, a great example of that, the narrative storytellers, so you know, are often an expert in at least one medium. And so that's to say they either are very good at video, uh, they're excellent at Pro Tools or audio, um, they're able to take content and take that content and craft it, often using a program, whether that's Final Cut, whether that's Pro Tools, um, whatever it might be, and, and they work very closely with the reporter to translate the reporting, there's often a story that goes along with this, into a multimedia project. Um, Amy O'Leary is somebody I like to talk about when I talk about narrative storytellers. Amy O'Leary came to the New York Times uh, a, couple, a year or two after I joined from NPR. She was actually working uh, at This American Life and doing those kinds of things. Um, I, I heavily recommend, NPR is a, a wonderful example of narrative storytelling. 
Um, and narrative storytelling can be done across mediums. So you can do narrative storytelling through just a photo slideshow. You could do narrative storytelling with a video. You could do it in audio like NPR does. But Amy has this wonderful way of coming through and being able to take, talk with a reporter, talk with a multimedia producer, and really turn that into something that is incredibly interesting to sit there and listen to and to, and to work on. And so another, another really good example of uh, that kind of, oh man, I keep forgetting this isn't Firefox, is this project called A Year at War. A Year at War is a project that I started working on um, about six months before I left the New York Times. And A Year at War follows the 187th Battalion as they travel, through, as they spend one year in Afghanistan um, fighting in, in the new surge. And so these are things that you guys are very used to doing. These are things that I see being produced all across college campuses. But to make it to the very top, you have to really, really be an excellent storyteller. And so this is a really good example of that, that capability. Pretty hard to make one with a comeback story for me. Like worrying about things that you're gonna hit or not. I hope he doesn't. He said that he might come back, but then there's no way to like I'll put no arms and stuff. I think about it like ten million times a day. Like worrying about it. Thinking like please don't like, bring him back to eight times. Just worrying about him. I'm a class one staff at school. I we sleep quiet at night. I think of Joey's dad, Sergeant First Class Brian Eich, who deployed to Afghanistan. Their mom's not in their lives. After she and Brian got divorced, the courts took away her right to see them. So for a year, while their dad's at war, the boys are living with their uncle, aunt, and three cousins in central Wisconsin. It was a lot worse than my wife and I thought it was gonna be, just seeing what they would, what they have to deal with day to day, just not having their dad. It was a lot more traumatic than I've ever pictured it. I quoted that one, and it was for me too. For Isaac and Joey, their dad's deployment meant leaving their home in upstate New York. Like lots of military kids, they're used to moving around. I don't like it when it's cold here. But this time, they had to start a new life in a new school without the stability of their own return. And so this, this is a really, really touching project, a very interesting. This is actually the only one. Most of the other stories are uh, out in Afghanistan. Um, but so, for example, on a project like this, if, you, if you're wondering how that gets made, um, this was a collaboration, I mean the credits across the bottom are, are quite long, but this was a collaboration of myself, Nancy Donaldson and Katrin Einhorn are the two narrative storytellers. Nancy is a Final Cut uh, pro wizard. She is a photographer and a videographer, but for this, the person shooting, not actually for this one exception, but is Damon Winter, who's also, he won the Pulitzer last year. And, and an interesting little quick note about Damon is, before this series, Damon had never shot a lick of video in his life. So it's just another example of how it's not enough nowadays to only have one skill. Like, it's just not enough to have one. You have to be able to, sure you have one skill, and you should really have a highly developed one skill, whether that's photography, whether that's writing, whether that's reporting, programming, information graphics, but you're going to be asked to have a secondary skill is the reality of the matter nowadays. And whether that secondary skill, if you're a writer, maybe it's audio. Maybe it's being really good at recording and cutting audio. If you're a photographer, likely it's gonna be, you're gonna be asked to do videography, especially with these new digital SLRs. If you're a programmer, Designing is also something you're going to want to be pretty good at. There's always these secondary skills that you're going to need to complement your primary skill. 
So I'm not one that's going to tell you that you have to get out there and be an expert at five or six skills, because I think that's impossible. I don't know anybody who's an expert at all of these things. But you do need to be an expert at one skill and then have a second skill that complements that in a way that if somebody asks you, hey, can you go cover the city hall meeting, you can say, absolutely, I'll cover that. And, and if you'd like, I'll take photos as well. And then all of a sudden, your editor says, oh, really, you can take photos? Well, I didn't know that. That's great to know. Maybe I can use you on this bigger story next time. Or maybe I can use you to just shoot photos and go out, and then all of a sudden you're shooting photos, and that's really what you had wanted to do. And then you're working in the video, and then you're doing these other things. So the more skills that you're at least familiar with, and the, and the better you are at your primary skill, the more doors it's going to open to do all of these other things. And so, so Damon's a wonderful example of how even at the highest level, it's just not enough to just be, just be doing one thing right now. Like you're going you're gonna to be asked to have a complementary skill. Um, and so, so photographers, videographers, narrative storytellers, we're all working together consistently across all of these different um, platforms. Now, programming. Programming is basically, like I said, how I got into, that's not what I want to do, how I got into the field. That was my one skill. I, am a, I have a computer science degree. I'm a, I'm a good programmer. And so I was able to go to the Times and say, look, I'm happy to build these things for you. I'd like to build them. I'll build these tools for you. But you should know that I also shoot photographs. You know, like I really like shooting photographs. Um, so, so the way I did it, the way I got into shooting my photographs is uh, is I <laughs> is I got really into um, panoramic photos. They weren't really doing panoramic 360 photos at the New York Times in about 2007, 2008. I know that they're ubiquitous now and they're all over. But what I told them is, look, there are these panoramic photos, and I'm really, really interested in, in learning how to do these. And they said, well, can you build a player that shows them that we can host on our website? And I said, yeah, I can build a player, but I'd also like to really be the one who shoots the photos so that I can figure out this process start to finish, and then I can train other people on how to do that. And so they said, OK, you know, we buy that. You go ahead, build the player, start figuring out how to take photos. And so over the next six months, along with Ray Jones, who's a photo, editor, uh, a photo producer at the New York Times, we set about doing all kinds of tests and all kinds of experiments and doing all these kinds of different um, photographs things. And eventually, it resulted in uh, uh, where is that? It, res it resulted in me getting sent out to the Democratic National Convention and shooting uh, photos at both in Denver and Minneapolis for the Republican National Convention. And so this, this is another example of doing what it takes to get your foot in the door so that then you're able to go out and do other things. Like, I really wanted to get out from the production process and start doing my own original content. And so I was telling some people about this experience last night, which happened to be one of the more terrifying experiences in my whole life, shooting this photo. But it was incredible. And as you can see, when I was able to take this and show the, oh, it's so dark on there, I'm sorry. But and show the New York Times, like, look, you can write about the Democratic National Convention, but I can help put you in the middle of the Democratic National Convention in a way that you can't do with writing, in a way that you can't do in a newspaper, and in a way that you can't even do on television. You know, it's, you, you try to push the boundary forward, you try to move it forward, and, and so you develop your secondary skill, and then all of a sudden you're getting sent to the Democratic National Convention, or you're getting sent to the Republican National Convention, or you're shooting video, or you're reporting on this, or you're doing infographics on that. So having at least two skills is, is absolutely fundamental right now. And then if those two skills complement each other, you're, in, you're putting yourself in an even better position for success. Um, so that, that's an example of how I did it, but there's a, there's a lot of examples of how, how that happens. Um, 
3 d artists is another another uh, position in there. Three d artists are extremely high demand. That is a very interesting and uh, provocative career. They can take you in advertising and Pixar films and those kinds of things. But in journalism, it is extremely important as well. Uh, Graham Roberts is a 3D artist at the New York Times. And uh, let me show you what Graham can do just through 3D. There's a graphic talking about how poor quality control over these radiation machines can lead to extreme, extreme damage to the human body. Um, so Graham designed this thing, and he's able to build in 3D a full radiation, I'm not exactly even sure what this is called, uh, intensity modulated radiation therapy machine. And so using 3D, Graham's able to walk you through a process, and obviously this is still all fundamentally rep uh, rooted in reporting, but where you can explain to somebody how this beam is being accidentally shot into different parts of people's bodies. This part's really cool. And you see how the, the beam opens and shuts. This isn't something that we can, I mean, yeah, theoretically, I guess we can maybe t take video, but we probably can't put video under this radiation stream. You know, it'll beam right through your camera and destroy it. And, and so this is, this is being used in, in a variety of newsrooms right now. And the potential for 3D is just really starting to be tapped, I think. Um, but it's, it's in demand at the Daily. We're looking to hire 3D artists. At the New York Times, they'll hire 3D artists at the Washington Post. So if you're a visual person, if you're into creating things, like I love creating things, you can get into Maya, you can get into 3DS Max, and really start creating these visual things. Again, fundamentally rooted in journalism and reporting. Graham did a lot of reporting to figure out how these radiation machines work. He gets specs on the machines. He does a whole variety of things. Um, another example is, um, I have this one linked right from my home page. Uh, 3D allows you to do things like create 3D images of what will come, things that you can't show yet. So for example, this is about the World Trade Center. And Graham created this full 3D rendering of what the World Trade Center is going to look like eventually. And then we combine it with photographs, panoramas of the plaza, um, you know, different information, different kinds of things. You combine that with audio narration by David Dunlap. But it will, there's no delicate way to say it. One world trade center will be a tempting target. But it will rise from a greatly solidified pedestal marked by those large steel beams designed to make it as impregnable as possible. For example, a blast wall in the lobby will shield the core, but admit daylight through narrow openings. Pay attention to four World Trade Center 2. This skyscraper, designed by Fumihiko Maki, shows a restraint and subtlety that has been missing in other plans. Maki has responded thoughtfully to the conflicting demands on his building. On one side is an expansive open lobby that will defer to and not to. Museum goers will proceed down ramp to a balcony overlooking the most impressive of the exhibition hall. They'll get their first glimpse of what's known as the last column because it was the last upright structural element removed from the World Trade Center ruins in 2002 after rescue and recovery workers had covered it with deeply personal messages and memorials to colleagues. Serving as a backdrop to the column will be a segment of the old slurry wall. That's one of the foundation walls that... <coughs> it may be safe to say that no national memorial has ever been built inches away from a train station through which tens of thousands of people pour every day. But a view of the lower level of the Trade Center shows how interrelated these structures are. And so as you see, again, a collaborative process between several different people with different skills. As you, some of those panoramas I shot, some of those panoramas I taught Fred Conrad how to shoot, who's a photographer of 35 years at the New York Times. Again, professionals being asked to learn new skills, to develop secondary skills. Uh, Tom Jackson's an incredible programmer who helped build this. Graham Roberts builds these 3D interfaces so we can visualize what the buildings are going to be like. There, you know, several people are involved in all of these processes, and there's jobs in each one of those different fields. Um, 
another just incredible, uh, and so I'll stay with information graphics, okay? Information graphics are a huge buzz right now. Uh, data visualization, 3D rendering, uh, <coughs> any, all of those kinds of things. Uh, and the New York Times, even though I no, I no longer work there, is by far and away the best information graphics team in the world. And they spend a lot of money on that and they put a lot of resources into it. But what's really interesting about their team is that most of the people on their team are not journalists by trade. They have backgrounds in things like economics, business, statistics, cartography, uh, you know, animation, 3D modeling. And then they take those skills and they apply them to journalism. And they do storytelling and narrative storytelling through these other skills that they've developed. Amanda Cox, who's probably uh, known as maybe the best infographic artist, news infographic artist in the world right now, is by trade a statistician. Uh, and so she can go into the numbers and using a statistics program called R, pull out tens or hundreds of different renderings of data in no time. And so that's how they do a lot of these information graphics. They don't go out and say, we want it to look like this. Let's make the data fit this. They take the data and they create dozens of visualizations. And then they try to see which one of those visualizations helps most effectively tell the story that they're trying to communicate. Um, let me see. Uh, what, which one did I want to show for Amanda? I mean, Amanda has so many things to show that it's almost hard to pick just one. Um, Oh, here's, here's a good one. This one isn't necessarily just Amanda's, but this is from the group. This is what's called a stat graph. Uh, it's something that most of you have probably seen, right? But what this is telling you is what, how different groups spend their day. And this was according to the American Times survey. And so, so they get this survey, and what they start doing is figuring out, well, what's the best way to show people how different sets of Americans are doing their time? And so you can see, you know, about... 4 a.m., 93% of all Americans are sleeping. Then as you get further into the day, by about 8 a.m., 75% of Americans are awake. And of that, 25% of all Americans are working at that time. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't remember. It was a small group there. Eating and drinking, doing those kinds of things. So this is all very interesting, right? This is one view of it. But then when you really start breaking down the data, let's see how it compares for just men. And so it shifts a little bit. And for women, it shifts a little bit. But then all of a sudden, you start breaking down a little more. Employed people, unemployed people, <laughs> white people, black people, Hispanic people, young, middle-aged, older, high school graduates, bachelors, advanced degrees, no children, one children. So all of a sudden, you see how you take this static graph and you start manipulating the data, and all of a sudden you're telling a story. And people are engaged, and they're interested, and you can go, let's just go into work here. And more than 95% of this, of this time is spent working at a main job, but also in categories. Then we break it down, white, black, and Hispanic for each one, and you show where these times are peaking. And so there's sleep, and you can see that the sleep peaks in different things. So these are all derived from numbers. And they don't say, let's put this in a stack graph. They, they say, well, what's the best way to tell the story of what these numbers are trying to tell us? So that's one thing. That's statistics-based information graphics, right? But let's look at visual and, and uh, 3D-based infographics. If you guys remember, uh, just you should hopefully remember, just two weeks ago or last week when the Moscow airport was bombed, right? By that night, the New York Times had made this graphic. And so... Where I want to start with that conversation is the reporting that goes into this is unbelievable. These people aren't just 3D modelers. They're not just statisticians. They're reporters. And as soon as this happens, they're on the phone with contacts in Moscow. They're trying to get uh, layouts and diagrams for the airport. They're analyzing any of the video and photographs that came out of there, trying to place where this happened in the airport. And this is all solid data. This is just as fact-checkable as anything that was written that day. It, it is extremely important to us as journalists that we get it right. And it's extremely important to Steve Duenas and his team there that they get it right. And so they go in and they do massive amounts of reporting to try to figure out these kinds of things. And then they build, as you can see, there's no huge bells and whistles here. There's no 
flash, there's no interaction, there's nothing. But it tells an incredible story. It shows where the explosion happened, talks about casualties. As you can see, we have a detail here of inside the airport. Then they send us here and say the detail of where in the entire airport that is. Pull out a little farther, show where that terminal is in the scope of the entire airport, then show where that airport is in, rel in relation to Moscow. So while it, it's almost easy to like glance at this and say, oh, okay, I get it, but, and skip over the incredible amount of information and reporting that goes into something and, and the thoughtfulness to make this so clear and so understandable. Uh, again, just yesterday, I saw them coming out with this. This is, and as you can see, they, they put in yesterday and the other days. This is a, talking about the battles that are going in in Tahir Square. Again, the reporting that goes into this is incredible. The first thing they're doing is checking it out. They're not building a graphic until they're sure what it is. They get schematics on Tahir Square. They get schematics on uh, Egypt. And, 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 you know, and yes, it does help to work for the New York Times. People are much more receptive to you calling and asking for information and stuff. But it's still fundamental reporting. And so this is showing how the Mubarak supporters come in and where in Tahir Square they're fighting and how protesters are using subway entrances to dump trash as well as detain Mubarak supporters. I mean, really, really captivating, interesting stuff. All done by artists. Artists who are reporters, you know. So there's, there, there, there are jobs there. I've seen people drawing and sketching and, and doing 3D. It's not, that long, it's not that far of a leap for you if you're a visual um, artist or an illustrator to try 3D or to get into some of these. You can even do 3D without using actual 3D rendering programs. There's several people at the New York Times who still do 3D just by using Illustrator and stuff like that. It's becoming less common because it's more difficult, but it is, it is possible. So info, information graphics uh, are, are really incredible and exceptional, um, but what you really have to remember is that there's nothing there if the reporting isn't there. Just showing somebody something that's beautiful or that spins or that whizzes isn't helping you do your job as a journalist. You should always be trying to do what is fundamentally your job as a journalist, which is informing, educating, and putting the news into context for other people. Um, so I, I, I'm just always fascinated with uh, all of the things that they're doing there. Uh, designers. Designers are a very real part of the New York Times, as well as every other, um, every other news institution. This is a project I worked on right after uh, the election of Barack Obama. This was done for inauguration weekend. And the concept behind this was that there was, Barack Obama built his campaign on this idea of hope and this idea of um, change. And so before he, right before he was inaugurated, I said, well, why don't we go out and ask all these people around the, around the country, red states, blue states, everywhere, what they hope Barack Obama is going to accomplish during his presidency. Because as soon as it starts, it's all going to be different. Some hopes are going to be realized. Some are going to be dashed. Some things are going to change. And so now, at that point in time, was the only time where you could grab all those hopes and round them all up. And, and then it gets more interesting. This thing becomes more interesting as time goes on. And you can view these hopes either um, in this random order or by popularity. And so then you click on that, and then all of a sudden the hopes go into order. So uh, why don't we listen to a couple, and you'll get a little better idea. I hope Obama implements universal health care because a number of my relatives do not have health care, and it impacts them every single day having to choose between medicine and other necessities of life. It's sad to see people walk around they can't get no kind of insurance or health care. I don't have health insurance right now. I have, was covered by my parents while I was a student, and I'm actually going to be covered myself fairly soon, but I couldn't afford it. So that's something that we really need right now for everyone. I mean, my dad had an accident. I hope that Obama really focuses on helping our environment because global warming is a very important issue that we have to focus on for future generations because I hope that President-elect Obama can bring about recovery of our economy. All of our hope is hinged upon a stable economy. And so as you can see, it's this idea that, um, that hope and, and, and change was going to happen, and so, we, and, and so we grasped it there. 
but the designer who worked on this with me, Andrew Kuhneman, is, uh, is wonderful. And he was able to take my concept. Originally, I had balloons, like, like real balloons, not speech balloons floating around. And he said, well, what if we change those into, into speech bubbles and put the topic on them? And why don't we lay these people across the bottom of it? So this, you know, and so you're working with these designers. Like, you can't do everything yourself. You need to be able to collaborate. You need to be able to work in conjunction with other people in order to uh, bounce ideas off them and have them strengthen your ideas and fact check you and say, well, that doesn't really make sense to me because I can't tell you how many times I made something that made total sense to me and I showed it to the person next to me and they said, I don't get it. And that's the worst thing that you can have happen to you if you're a journalist. Like, I don't care how incredibly exciting it is, but if the person doesn't get it, if they don't understand it, you fail to do your job. And there's nothing more frustrating than spending a bunch of time doing something and then failing to do your job. So designers, and I worked with Andrew. After Andrew and I started working together, we worked together almost on every single project. Like we developed a really good working relationship. He understood what I was trying to do a lot of the time. I understood that he could take my stuff and make it look more attractive, look more appealing, maybe be more usable, do those kinds of things. A really qu quick side note on this project, too. If you look at what this project is, this is journalism that was established over 100 years ago. And by that, I mean this is simply what we call man-on-the-street journalism. You see it in newspapers every single day. People just go out, and you'll ask somebody what they think about a current topic, and you get a wide variety of responses to that, and you write a news story saying this is how people are feeling about this same thing. Journalism, fundamentally, has been the same for hundreds of years. And certain, while it's changing and, and it's always evolving, certain fundamental things are going to remain the same. And so what we've done here is we've taken the simple man-on-the-street journalism and turned it into something that's a little more engaging, maybe, or a little more interesting. But what, what's true still, though, is if you go through and you listen to these, what was happening is a lot of people like, OK, yeah, yeah. And then you say, oh, well, they have a lot of different perspectives. and so. I don't really care that much anymore because I'm just going to hear all these different perspectives, right? And so I said, you know, and even I thought that. And so you say, I hope that Obama. You say, so what can you do about that? How can I get people to stay engaged in that? And the answer to that for this one was this little I hope so too button. And the idea is, as soon as you land on somebody who feels the same way you do, that, that's really my hope. You know, I really hope Obama fixes the economy. And as soon as you land on that person, you have this incentive to click, oh, I hope so too. And then all of a sudden you voted. And then all of a sudden you feel like you're participating in this journalism. And you're engaged in this story. And you're helping to actually write this story for other people. And so as you can see, you just you start to layer and you start to push it further. And you work with different people and you figure out, well, what's the story and how can I best tell it? And how can I get people to be engaged? And how can I do those kinds of things? And so, and so this is a really good example of that. But again, Myself, with uh, doing some of the concept and production, Katrin Einhorn was the audio producer who went out and worked with dozens of freelancers to get them to get this audio. Then she cuts it together. Andrew Kuhneman designs it. Aaron Pilhofer builds the back end system where I send votes to. And so he's the one who makes it so that if we want to put these into by popularity, I do that all based on asking Aaron, hey, what's the most popular story? And his database returns it to me. So there's programmers, there's designers, there's audio narrative storytelling experts, there's producers. There's all these different jobs that work in collaboration. And so that's a big part that I think that you guys should be extremely ready for wherever you go, which is collaborating with other people, working in combination with and exercising other people's skills and being open to them like working with you to help further your skills. When I first got to the Times, it was a bit of a shock. You know, I thought I, thought I had a pretty good idea of what I was doing. I was maybe a little uh, strong-willed uh, is probably a nice way to put it. And so I would get there, and, I was, and it was hard for me at first to take uh, what I felt was criticism, but it was constructive criticism. It was people who were trying to push my work to the next level. It took about six months before I realized that this was actually the best possible thing you could get from somebody. Criticism and feedback to try to push your work further, to try to do better, to try to be more uh, 
receptive to other people's opinions so that your work as a journalist can be seen and viewed and appreciated by the widest possible group po that you can reach. You know, and so working collaboratively and in teams is something that you're going to be doing. I know that you ha you're doing it at the university level, but you should continue to expect to do that into the professional level. Even, as I said, reporters, writers, they're working with us. They're asked to collaborate with us before they even get too far into their story so that we can talk with them about how to gather the content we need and how to do those kinds of things. Um, so anyways, uh, maybe now is a good time to kind of, I've talked about a lot of different jobs in the newsroom. I've talked about a lot of different projects. I could, I could go on and I could talk more about some of the themes that I do in my work, or I'd also be happy to start um, talking about taking questions and doing that kind of stuff, uh, if you guys are interested in that. Any questions yet? One over here. Um, what is the rankings that you guys had when you voted on that? Could you then display the rankings on that about which topics were? Sure, they were in there. I'll okay. show you. And then can you share? Uh, can you talk a little bit about the tools that you guys use at the daily in order to get from? You know, what? How do you create this stuff? And what tools are you using to create stuff for the iPad? Sure. Well, those are not necessarily related questions. But first of all, um, when you go into one of these, kill the audio. You can see right here, uh, 10,200 people have voted for this one. Um, so we do do that. Sometimes you show numbers, sometimes you don't show numbers. And I'll bring up another one in a second, because uh, there are a couple themes I'll, I'll touch on for you guys. But uh, <coughs> at the times, the, the, the things we used to develop was Flash, HTML, JavaScript. Um, we could probably get into a very long conversation about the future of Flash future of client-side technologies. I would rather not get into that with all of you right now, although I'm happy to talk about it afterwards with you guys. But I don't think that Flash is going to disappear in the next six months, year, two years. I mean, Flash is a, a very well-developed product that works extremely well for what it's used for. And there's not anything quite yet that can completely replace Flash. So the idea that it's going to get washed away in the, in the short time, I think, is a mistake. At the daily, it's a little different bit of a process because that's an iPad-specific project. The actual app is written in Objective-C. Um, and then there's a content management system. And then we develop uh, different things using uh, the same things we use at the New York Times, Illustrator, Photoshop. Uh, it's actually a very similar process to how most websites work. You work within a content management system. You provide it with access to whether it's video, audio, writing, different kinds of files. And that's how we go about pr producing our work. I, I don't know how deep I can get into the nuts and bolts of the daily stuff be, um, because it just launched and because uh, there is some uh, fun in the mystique behind it. But um, that, is a, that is an interesting thing. Was there another question, or, or did you guys want me to talk a little bit about social media? OK, go ahead. That for me is very important in when you work with the media and newspapers and also it happens in different levels, local levels and international levels is the issue of ethics and the technical skills. So you showed many uh, interesting, amazing projects you developed with your technical skills on that. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt any kind of uh, bias or things that were not the most ethical thing to do that you had to navigate through that and put your project on using your skills and or if you haven't been on that personally have you seen that going on and how would you say of how to deal with that on every day on an everyday basis? Sure. Um, I the 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 quick answer is no, I've never worked on a project that ethically I didn't believe in. Uh, that was fundamentally easy at the New York Times as it is at the Daily. Like, uh, but I, again, I'll speak mostly to the New York Times because that's where most of my experience was. Uh, the New York Times is a wonderful, wonderful journalism institution in the sense that 
they are fully committed to funding uh, journalism wherever it may be and telling whatever the story may be. I know there are people who don't trust and don't like the New York Times. I know there's people who don't trust and don't like News Corp or the Daily, the iPad app. But for myself personally, it's easy. I would never put myself in a situation where I'm working on something I don't think is ethically right. But as a, and as a journalist, if I found myself at an institution where I was asked to do that, I'd quit. Um, and I know that sounds maybe simplistic, but as a journalist, all you have going for you is your objectivity and transparency. And so I tend to use those words really closely together because <laughs> as many people know and talk about, like true objectivity is impossible. I mean, none of us can be truly objective um, because we've grown up in a certain part of the world and we're American or we're Chinese or we're this or we're that. So we have ingrained in us philosophies and thought processes and styles. And so we can try to be objective, but being being truly objective, I think, is impossible. But being truly transparent is completely possible. And so if I'm truly transparent in my, um, this is actually very helpful because transparency is something I wanted to talk about. If I'm truly transparent, then at least I can put all of the facts on the table. And if you want to argue with me over the facts, or if you want to quarrel over our interpretation of the facts, and that's fine, and that's valid. But I don't want to have this thing where you say, well, I don't, where are you getting those facts? I don't believe you. I don't understand it. And so being transparent is often one of my, my goals in, in order to make sure that people know I am being ethical. And so a really good example of that is um, this project called uh, How the Pentagon Spread Its Message. This was a really great project that I worked on with David Barstow, who's an investigative reporter um, who will actually won a Pulitzer Prize for this story. But David, this story, well, why don't I just play the first part of it and it'll introduce itself. A striking display of dissent, it would be called the General's Revolt. A striking display of dissent in the spring of 2006, when several retired generals began publicly, and for the first time, criticizing Donald Rumsfeld for his handling of the Iraq War. Should someone resign? Absolutely. Who? Secretary of Defense, to begin with. The best solution is the, the Secretary uh, to step down and we get fresh blood in, in the uh, Pentagon. There was no zero sense of urgency on the part of the Secretary of Defense to, uh, to provide the uh, requisite resources to to truly develop the Iraqi security forces. I feel that he has micromanaged the generals who are leading our forces there to achieve uh, our strategic objectives. I really believe that we need a new Secretary of Defense. In response, the Pentagon quickly embarked on a public relations counteroffensive. Its aim was to cast the dissenting generals as a tiny minority whose criticisms were hurting the war effort. But it was also a vivid example of the Pentagon's close collaboration with influential military analysts, retired military officers who were presented by TV and radio networks as distinguished independent experts on national security. Yet to the Pentagon, they were known as, quote, message force multipliers, surrogates who would reliably echo administration talking points as if they were their own views. Through five years of war, the Pentagon has both cultivated and used this group in a vast and largely hidden campaign to generate favorable coverage of the administration's wartime performance. Favored military analysts, particularly those with ties to defense contractors deeply vested in the administration's terrorism policies, have been wooed in hundreds of briefings with senior officials and have repeatedly been mobilized to counter war critics as internal Pentagon records obtained by the New York Times show. Such was the case on Friday, April 14, 2006, just as the General's Revolt was dominating headlines. That morning, Mr. Rumsfeld instructed his aides to summon a group of the radio and TV military analysts to a meeting in his office early the next week. That same day, senior Pentagon officials helped two Fox News analysts, Tom McInerney and Paul Vallely, to write an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal defending Mr. Rumsfeld. Soon after, General Mallory wrote the Pentagon, quote, any input for the article will be appreciated. The general got his input, and quickly. Mr. Rumsfeld's office soon sent statistics and talking points 
to rebut the notion of a spreading revolt. The memo described how frequently Mr. Rumsfeld had met with military leaders and said that, quote, U.S. senior military leaders are involved to an unprecedented degree in every decision-making process in the Department of Defense. Other statistics were provided as well. When a third military analyst, Jed Babin, called the Pentagon to say he was going on Fox that day, he was urged to stress that the dissenting generals represented less than 1% of all retired generals and flag officers. Mr. Babin's contact at the Pentagon reported on their conversation, writing in an email that Mr. Babin called him, quote, an evil genius for that particular talking point. Soon after, Mr. Babin was on Fox, arguing that the generals criticizing Mr. Rumsfeld were statistically insignificant in their numbers. And then the meeting Mr. Rumsfeld had asked for came on Tuesday, April 18th. More than a dozen military analysts, including those who often appeared on ABC, CBS, CNN, and Fox, assembled at the Pentagon for a meeting with Mr. Rumsfeld and General Peter Pace, then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It didn't take long for conversation to turn to the general's revolt. Okay, so as you can see, this is a very, very interesting story about some very, very serious events shaping the world. But it's also really, really hard to understand, first of all. And it also relies on documents that David Barstow worked really hard to obtain, but that you all, as readers in the New York Times on Sunday when this is published, have to just take his word that he has, right? Like, let's step back 10 years ago before we were using the internet uh, the way we are now. David would have written this story in the New York Times the same way he did, and it would have appeared with what are called little graphic tears, which are, you take the memos and you scan them in, and then you put them as little graphical elements in your story, so you can be like, see, I have them. This is proof that I have these memos. But then you go on and write it, and it's our, as readers, it's our responsibility to just believe the New York Times, right? But Dave and I were talking about it, and he said, you know what I'd really like to do, Gabe? I spent so much time sending FOIAs out to the government and getting back redacted stuff. And it's true. The guy sits surrounded by stacks of papers and boxes. I mean, it's, it's actually hilarious. But, <laughs> but he says, you know what I'd really like to do? I'd like to be able to provide these documents to our readers so that they can say, they can go through them and see that not only did I write my story accurately, but I didn't take these things out of order. I didn't take them out of context. I didn't do any of those things. And so if you, if you notice, as you go through, any time that we show a document, I brought down this little view document button. And so that at any point in time, any point in time that we reference a document that we use to tell the story, you can click on the view document button and it'll allow you to go read the unredacted, or as unredacted as we could get it, document. You can download it, you can return to the audio spot, you can go through all the documents, that, not, not every single document he got for this entire project, there were hundreds for that, but you could go through all these documents and see, and, and so you're able to say, see this, see, this is real. This is real. This is a transparent event so that we can tell you, our reader, like, I understand that you're concerned that this is a super important story and you might feel that we're taking a New York Times liberal bias to it. And, and so in order to counter those, or the same thing at the Daily, in order to counter what might be seen as a, a conservative bias to some things, the, the, the answer to that, the solution to that, is to be transparent in your journalism. And the Internet's wonderful for that. The Internet is an inherently transparent medium. You're able to go in and see the source of pages and do all these different kinds of things. And so why not give these documents? And so this has led, not directly, but uh, I mean, it was coming anyways, but the New York Times now publishes huge data dumps um, in a way that people are able to access, ex access them and understand them. So the Guantanamo docket was something that came out shortly after uh, that general's report did, and this is based on the exact same concept. These are all documents that the New York Times, through FOIA requests, through different requests, are able to get about all the different um, detainees in Afghanistan, or, uh, in Guantanamo Bay, right? And I, I don't know exactly where these detainees stand now, but as you can see, we did the reporting to go get all of these different documents. And you can go through these documents, and lawyers for the people in Guantanamo Bay have called the New York Times to thank them because they had not been able to get these documents in order to defend 
their, their clients. And so, as you can see, like transparency, providing it. And so that's how we work with these ethical problems, to get back a little bit to the question, is you, is you, you, use the, you leverage the internet to become transparent. One more quick example of this. is our uh, debate analyzer. And so we launched this also um, during the 2008 election. And so the concept behind this, right, is like many people, and I don't know if this one right here is gonna work because they switched streaming <coughs> things. Maybe I can find one, just one second. So this is the newest version of the same thing. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, distinguished guests, and fellow Americans. Tonight I want to begin by congratulating the men and women of the 112th Congress. And so the idea behind this is this is purely a service, which journalism is a part of. Journalism is a job where you should feel a responsibility to providing information and providing context for people out there looking for it. And so the idea behind this and the idea behind the debate analyzer was that a lot of people don't have time to watch these things, or a lot of people aren't interested in watching it right then, or a lot of people are maybe only interested in a specific part about what they talked about. And so what you can do with this is you can go through and jump to any part in his speech, and it'll sync the video to that, you're able to read it, because as you guys know, just as well as I do, with politicians, hearing what they say is one thing, but going back and reading what they just said to you is a whole nother thing. <laughs> Many of them are very, you know, have the silver tongue and they can, you know, say something and it sounds really nice, but you go back and you read what they just said, and you, oh, that, that's not exactly what it sounded like, you know? Or um, you wanna just jump to the Rebuilding America, it, it, for the debates, you could go see just what they said about guns. If you're just interested in what uh, the conservative, or uh, I'm sorry, the Republican um, candidates had to say about guns, you were able to just jump and see what they said about guns. Purely transparent um, service type journalism that's helpful to the readers and that helps people become more educated and make better decisions uh, in their voting or in whatever it is they might do. Any more? Another question? I know that was kind of a tangent. Oh, yeah, question? Go ahead. Yeah, I just have a uh, question. What's the, uh, the short end of the time scale from idea to pushing it out to the server on one of these projects? That's a good question. Um, did everybody hear it? What's, what, what's the time scale on, on these projects, and, and specifically what's the shorter end of the timeline? And uh, that question isn't quite as simple as it sounds. I was talking with some students earlier about this, too. Multimedia production generally takes time. Like it takes longer to, let's say, recut a video than it does to retop the story you just wrote. And so you have to think about it very, very delicately when you decide what you want to put your multimedia production resources behind, right? Because it takes a lot longer. For example, that the Pentagon piece that we were looking at a minute ago, that took four months in the end. And that's not just because it took four months for the actual work. It took four months. I mean, David reported that story for over two years. We just worked on the multimedia part of it for about four months. So there's, very, there's these very long, long-end projects. And then the way you deal with the short-end production is you build tools. And, the, and so we built multiple tools at the New York Times that allows them to turn around stories that otherwise they wouldn't be able to do. Because what we were finding is that we were a real bottleneck for, let's see if they have just an Egypt page, I do. Um, we were, multimedia production was becoming a real bottleneck in terms of news. Like they wanted a multimedia timeline, they had to find the flash guy, the flash guy built the timeline, he worked with the reporters doing that kind of stuff. That just wasn't able to succeed, we weren't able to do it. So you build a tool that makes it so the reporter can go to a back end, very simply put in a date, put in a photo, put in the, the reporting that they've done, and then all of a sudden they have a timeline being built automatically. <coughs> so we can now turn timelines around in as quick as you can type. 
you know, or you can you see there's some things that you can build tools for, audio tools, um, audio slideshows. Joe Weiss built sound slides, right? Before Joe Weiss built sound slides, it used to take forever to do an audio slideshow. You had to time all these things out. You had to do those things. So, so there's not one like answer I can give you. Like, it depends on what kind of multimedia you're trying to produce. But in order to do quick turn multimedia, most of the time you're going to have to do it based on using tools and not custom projects. Uh, and so our multimedia productions went from you know, as quick as 30 minutes uh, to turnaround times and months. Oh, go ahead. Um, I'm really interested in like graphic design, logo design, and I heard you talking about Flash, 3D's Max, you know, uh, Maya. As somebody that's on a college student's budget and those programs being really expensive, what's the best way to get started in those programs? That's a good question. First of all, um, I think, I don't know if I'm going to have an answer that really makes you happy to tell you the truth. Um, I think that most of those offer some kind of student discounts. But I do know that someone was telling me that right up in your lab right now, you have CS5 with Photoshop, After Effects, and all the whole flash and the whole suite of tools. And, and that's always how I did it. I mean, I did it through the university. And then you go to your employer, and your employer hopefully provides those tools. But you know, I wish I did have a better answer for you on how. I know Maya and those are extremely expensive, extremely expensive. And uh, I certainly can't advocate doing anything illegal. So uh, <laughs> those routes exist, but hopefully you can get it done the proper way through your school um, or free trials that you can download or student discounts. But uh, there's also there's always there's almost always some free ones that are free, like Blender, I believe, is a free 3D <laughs> tool that can help you get the fundamentals down before you maybe make the leap to something like Maya. Google SketchUp is a very quick tool that you know really does get used, and you can use to do some certain. 3D type things, but as far as how to get Maya for cheap, I, I can't really help you there. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the workflow at Daily? I, I understand if you don't get into the nuts and bolts of that, but just uh, just the way to approach a story, I, 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 I would imagine it would be very different than in a newspaper or if you know, there's some crucial difference or not. Sure. Um, and um, you could also, also uh, talk a little bit about what's the, the background of the they're like working as a reporter. Is it like a reporter of the mediocrity, uh, or is it just still something like everyone has his kind of his or her expertise? So sure. I would be you know interested in those practical issues now um, we on the daily. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the daily is not that much different fundamentally from the New York Times, except for the fact that it's one twelfth the size or something like that. You know, the New York Times is extremely big and the daily is small. Um, but fundamentally, the way we approach stories is the same. You get a, you get a story, you, or you, you decide on a topic, or you find a thread, or you do something, and then you sit down and you, you have a conversation with several people, and you say, well, what's the best way to tell this story? Now, at the New York Times, and maybe a list, little less so at the Daily, because it's a, more of a multimedia interactive environment as a whole, um, but at the New York Times, there's almost always a, a written story that's going to go with it. And then you say, well, would it be appropriate to have video on this? Would it be appropriate? Do we need voices? Do we need audio? Do we need an infographic? Do we need some sort of social thing so that we can interact with, you know, is this something that we want to hear from our audience on? Um, and the same thing goes with the daily. Like, uh, and, and because I haven't worked there uh, very long, <coughs> I can't really speak much to longer term projects. But uh, for those ones that we have done a little bit of work on, the process remains the same. It's uh, you find a story, you speak about: Do we need to send a videographer? Do we need to send a photographer? Uh, the answer is no. They're not just because it's at the daily. One person isn't responsible for doing all those things. No, nope. they employ the same type of that same list I just ran down of uh, editor all the way down through designer, 3D artist, infographic designer, programmer. All those people also exist at the daily. Those, those are fundamental jobs in journalism that now exist, and I don't see going away anytime very soon. Um, when you get to maybe some of like, maybe some place like the Oregonian, some place like Denver Post, uh, the Roanoke Times, at those smaller shops, like medium-sized shops, uh, you might be asked to do several things. 
I, you know, their budgets are different, their constraints are different. But I also don't see that necessarily as a negative thing. Like, I want to be really clear that, like, I've been uh, in some ways lucky enough to work at national publications um, my whole career, except for uh, in college. But um, there's a lot to be said for going to a mid-sized paper or even a small paper where you get to do all things. Like, I know a lot of people who are very interested in writing, but they also want to do the, shoot the video for it or shoot the photographs for it. At the New York Times or at the Daily, that's unlikely that that's going to happen, that you're going to be responsible for all aspects of the story. But at a mid-size or small-size paper, that, that becomes much more likely. And so, so that, you guys should think about that. You know, like everybody, a lot of places I go, like, oh, you work at the New York Times, I wish I could work at the New York Times. Well, yeah, there are some great things that are working at the New York Times, right? But one of the things that maybe you don't think about is there's somebody at the New York Times who can do almost everything I do better than I can. You know, so that's why I was saying, like, I hung my hat on program. There were very few people at the New York Times who could program better than me, right? But as far as shoot photographs or shoot video or doing 3D model, even if I wanted to do those, it wouldn't have been appropriate because there were experts there who could do that. And the same goes at the daily. And at these mid-sized papers, that's not necessarily the case. You could probably be the one who's doing both of those kinds of things. Um, the main difference right now, I would say, between, let's say, the New York Times and the Daily is at the Daily, we know exactly how you're consuming our content. We know down to the pixel how you're consuming our content. We know the device you're using, and, and because of that, we can spend more time on one story, maybe just deciding exactly how we want to play that. On the New York Times, there's a lot of variables. These people might be consuming it on their phone. They might be consuming it on an internet browser. They might be consuming it on a tablet. Uh, we don't know what their resolution is. We don't know the size of their screen. We don't know if they have audio involved. You know, there are all these like outstanding things. And, and those, with those constraints comes certain amounts of creativity and different things you kind of do. But at the daily, we're able to sit down right now on a daily term basis and really craft this one story for one presentation and be confident that it's going to be delivered that way. And so that's, I'd say, the key difference between what I'm doing now and what I was doing then. Um, when, I was, when I was working at the Times, we had to be much more flexible with how it was going to be consumed, and that leads you to design differently. Um, at the Daily, we know exactly how it's going to be consumed, and that leads you to design di differently. Something that's important about both of those points, and something I've talked with some of the students about before right now, is constraints and the idea of constraints, right? And uh, most people think of constraints as bad, as in like, oh, you don't know how, b you have to be flexible, or the iPad, let's, let's say the iPad, 1024 by 768. That's a constraint. You know, like, I, I have to design within that thing. That's not a bad thing. Constraints often are wonderful things that will lead you to do even more creative projects. To have somebody say, when, when you're faced with this thing where, oh, you can do anything, then oftentimes you're so unfocused or you try to do everything and it turns into just an amalgamation of nothingness, almost. Mm -hmm. you, you apply constraints to yourself. And I encourage you guys to do this on your own projects. Give yourself constraints on your projects and watch your creator, creativity flourish. Because by telling yourself, you know, no, I could take the easy route, I could you know, use a huge image because I have a huge image, or I can use this audio because I have this audio. Well, don't do that. Set yourself some constraints. Say, I only want to use three photos, and I want to use only 30 seconds of audio, and see what you can do with that kind of stuff. Or I want to do these things. So, so these constraints, and that was a big shock to me, too, coming to the Times. You know, I thought I was going to be able to have access to all these limitless resources and do whatever it is I want, and all of a sudden I had constraints, and Deadlines are constraints, and editors are constraints, and the photography you have available to you is a constraint, and working with other people is a constraint. But what, you, what I came to discover is that I should really view these things as like helpful. Like it's, it's helpful for me to be able to say, well, oh no, I have to design for 1024 by 768, and all I have available to me is swiping and touching. Like, it's not very easy to type in on the iPad, so, you know, we don't do a lot of, like, text input or those kinds of things. You know, those are constraints, but these constraints lead us to be even more creative, I think. So I often encourage people, when you're working on a project, if, you're, if you can't seem to focus or if you have too many ideas or something, 
Start applying some constraints to your own work. Or go to your professor, go work with somebody else and ask them you know, how, how you can apply constraints to your work and then flourish and try to creatively work around those things. I mean, it's just like the same thing you see with a little kid when you hide their cookie, right? And then they work out a creative way to go find the stool and drag it up to the table and climb on top of it. And all of a sudden, they figured out a new way to, to get to the same end, but they've done it in a more creative way. You can do that to yourself in journalism every single day. And so, uh, so really the process is, as far as, as far as now, aren't that different between the Daily and the New York Times other than... Um, the amount of content coming through at the Times is obviously they have 1,100 more people uh, reporting than the Daily does, and so you have different, and, that, and that's a constraint. And so I'm forced to work within that constraint at the Daily and try to do creative things with uh, situations that I might not otherwise have had it at the New York Times. Any other questions? Wondering, was it why? Why did you choose to leave the New York Times to go work at the Daily? Like, what were? How was? Was the New York Times like not affiliated with? Kind of, did you have your career and things you wanted to do? Like, looking for something different, or why? Was it just sure, that's yeah, that's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, believe me, my mom asked me that every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the answer is that I wanted to get out in front of tablets. You know, and I really do feel that there is, that Steve Jobs, that Google, that all of these people who are investing a lot of money in the tablets and these kinds of things that I have my notes on when I speak with you guys are on to something. And so part of being a journalist in the way that I'm a journalist, which is to say a multimedia journalist and somebody who is responsible for not only programming but producing projects, is to stay current on technology. And at the Times, one of the constraints, I'll say at the Times, is that there are so many people that it's hard to necessarily really like get in and own a project in the same way that I was offered at the Daily to come be art director of news and really get in and start chopping up and having a lot of, a lot of control and influence and say in how these things work. At the Times, there's people who've been working there for 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, and who are extremely talented and wonderful, wonderful journalists. And it was going to take me quite a bit of time to be able to work up high enough to really start to influence certain aspects of the organization. And at The Daily, I had an opportunity to go there and immediately have some input into how to do these things. But really, most of it was the, the opportunity to get out in front of tablets and try to experiment and try to innovate and try to push journalism in a new direction. I had a five wonderful years at the Times. So I have, and I, I don't need, there are no hard feelings whatsoever with me leaving. Um, I hope to maybe go back one day and work there again. But for now, it was just important for my own personal development to try to understand this new technology, to try to see what kind of journalism could happen on these devices that are mobile to a certain extent, that have GPS built in, that use touch interface. I mean, ever since Minority Report and even before, I've been like really interested in how we can use our bodies to manipulate interfaces and stretching and pinching and, and doing all those kinds of things. And also another reason why was because it was a challenge. And it's not to say that the New York Times wasn't a challenge anymore. The New York Times, you can find a challenge there uh, the moment you step through the door. But I wanted to personally challenge myself and, to, and try something new. Like often it can be easy if you work yourself into something that you're in a good position and you can go there and you see it at jobs everywhere and you see it um, in all walks of life where you've worked yourself into some place where you're extremely comfortable, things are extremely easy, you have no real incentive to push yourself harder, to think more critically. And, and I wanted to kind of continue to try to push myself. I wanted to say, I knew it was going to be a lot of work I knew that uh, you know there was going to be a different kind of ethos behind the journalism. I knew that the understanding the technology was going to be difficult, and and I and I, I said to myself, you know, it would be easy to not take this opportunity to stay at the Times to continue, continue to try to innovate and produce there. But I was really happy with the work I had done there, and I really felt that it was time to try to push my own work to a new level. 
And I thought I would have been skipping out on, on that kind of challenge to myself if I didn't take this opportunity. And there's also something to be said for being part of launching the first ever tablet newspaper. That was never gonna, that's never gonna happen again. Now it's been done. So there's nobody else who can come through and say that they were art director for news on the first ever tablet newspaper. You know, that's something I can now put on my resume. And so let's say I know the New York Times has an iPad application and I know they're developing another uh, iPad type thing. But let's say in five years, I can go back to the New York Times and say, look, I've now started two or three newspapers that are tablet based. And, and so why don't, why don't I come back and run your tablet? Or the Washington Post or El Mundo or El Pais or um, any or the Guardian or you know, all these different newspapers around the world. Um, I just really want to diversify, to expand, and to challenge myself, and to see if I can do it. And it's, it has been extremely difficult. I mean, we've been pushing, everybody who works there has been pushing at least 12 hour days, five days a week for the past three months. And I mean, I'm not griping because I knew I was getting into that. But I wanted to see, like, do I still have that in me? Do I still have the drive and the energy and the innovation? And, and, and the answer, I hope, is yes. And, and the other thing is that there, there's a real excitement around the product at the daily. There's a real sense of like, they want to try to do something totally new. And when I went to the Times five years ago, that same feeling existed. They were just starting to kind of get into uh, the, new, the new media, and, and not just starting, they've been doing it long before I got there. So I don't mean to say uh, by any means that I brought, it, brought, brought that to the New York Times. But the technology was just starting to become available to do these types of things we started doing in about 2005, 2006. Like I said, Flash had taken a step forward. Um, you were now able to do all these interactive things with databases. Visualizations were becoming easier. That has now like not leveled off in the sense that there's not going to continue to be innovations on the web. There's not going to continue to be uh, different things. But while I was at the New York Times, like. I was one, you know, the here Faces of the Dead, which is a project, um, one of the first projects I ever worked on there, uh, was the first ever outward-facing database at the New York Times. Um, so this is a project where you can go through and see uh, the face of every single person who's died in the either Iraq or Afghanistan war. This is all based on a database. Uh, I published this. I think you can go through to the chart and. The beige is uh, Iraq deaths. The purple is Afghanistan deaths. So you can see a story being told right there just through the graphics. But I had done a lot of those things. Like we had done live streaming video for the first time. We had done push notification, like not through the iPad type thing, but through like you come to our website and we're pushing you information. So I just, I had done a lot of things that I was interested in doing when I got there. And now all of a sudden there's this new technology. There's this new device that's somewhat unexplored and hasn't really been pushed. And so that, for me, is interesting to stay right on the bleeding edge of the technology and see how that intersects with journalism. I'm really, really interested in how technology and journalism influence each other. And I think that there's just, oh, that, that's why, like, I'm, I'm glad you reminded me to talk about this, is that I think right now is such an exciting time for journalism. And I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of like kind of like doom and gloom around it lately because of business models and, and how does it get paid and, and, you know, will the daily subscription work and the Times is about to put up a metered model and, and there's all these different like kind of negative aspects, but the internet has revolution, revolutionized journalism in a way that hasn't happened since, you know, like being able, the printing press and then printing photos and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden we have this medium where we can connect and, and have a conversation with our readers and have a conversation with those people who want to influence the news and, and be encouraged. And we have Twitter and we have Facebook and we have all of these like really, really interesting journalism things that inf in impact journalism and influence the different ways we're doing things. And I find that incredibly exciting. And I think that's why uh, some was telling me that journalism in the school, the Enrollment at the School of Journalism here has increased. That's true across the nation, across all schools, journalism schools are building. And that's because it's just such an exciting time. And, and the other reason is the internet has helped connect us. Like we see what's going on in Egypt in almost real time. Like that's wild. That's wild that, you know, like no longer do you have to 
wait to see what's going on in Egypt, or do you have to do those things? And so, and so I find that just, I just want to like encourage you all to be excited about journalism. Like, it's an extremely exciting time. There's limitless opportunities. There's new devices, like mobile is going to be this huge new frontier, uh, GPS-based stuff, um, you know, communication. The Daily now has audio comments that you can leave on the site, which is like a really interesting, like, do I necessarily want to hear people's comments? I don't know if I do, but it's interesting. Like, it's an interesting idea. It's a, it's a cool concept. Soon, like, I don't know anything about the iPad 2. Let me be very clear about that. Apple is as tight-lipped with us as they are with anybody else. But assuming the iPad 2 has a forward-facing camera, right, all of a sudden you might be able to interact in real time with journalists at your newspaper, let's say, or leave video comments, or connect with other people who are maybe looking at the same uh, newspaper article as you, but that person's in Egypt, and we allow you guys to connect, and you can talk to somebody on the ground. So I just find the whole technology, technology is influencing journalism in a way right now that hasn't happened before. And, and by right now, I mean in the last 20 years, in a way that hasn't happened before. And I, I just see that continuing to uh, change and grow, and that's really why I switched to the daily, is to just try something new, to be right on the edge of journalism and, um, and experiment. But it certainly doesn't, and the Times does, it doesn't reflect, I mean, the Times is an incredible, incredible institution who's committed to uh, innovation and improvement. And uh, part of what I wanted to do was take a shot at them, you know? Like, if you're a journalist, you want to, like, you should feel competitive. You, it's a competitive environment. People are trying to scoop you. They're trying to do better than you. They're trying to do those things. The Times, as far as I'm considered, is the gold standard of journalism right now. And so I had the, the wonderful benefit of being involved in that for five years. But now I kind of wanted to take a step back and say, well, can somebody take a run at that? Like, let's challenge them. Like, competition is good. I want to compete. I want to have the best story. I want to do the most innovative thing. And so if I can push myself and push the New York Times at the same time, then everybody wins. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. But again, like my mom, like I said, my mom asked me every day why I did it. So. <coughs> Talk about advertising at the daily. I don't know much about advertising at the daily. Um, I am, uh, you know, like I said, just like it did. I wouldn't have been able to talk much about advertising at the New York Times either. I'm just not involved. The daily keeps it, as far as I can tell, as strictly split as. Uh, the New York Times kept it, and I'm not at all involved in advertising operations. I do know that they're very excited about the opportunity of A, again, controlling exactly what somebody sees and how they see it, and the fact that the ads appear much more like glossy magazine ads, um, which I think probably they can get more money for, but I don't, I don't know that for sure. You don't consider that in the design concept at all? Advertisements? No. At the New York Times, I did have to consider it sometimes in my design. Like at the New York, like I know at the Daily, as of right now, uh, advertisements are basically what we would call interstitials on the internet, which means they come in between your stories. So you have to like you swipe past them, but they're not embedded on our pages whatsoever right now. But at the New York Times, sometimes they were, and we did have to say, you know, there's going to be an advertisement right here. But all, we didn't worry about what that advertisement was or anything other than the fact that it did impact the design to a certain extent. Did you talk about social media? I didn't, but I, I could jump into that really quick. Yeah, if somebody else has another question, they could. We're actually uh, running out of time. Um, are there any questions? <coughs> I think uh, what we'll do is we have the room until 6 o'clock, so um, you're really just kind of hang out if you want to. Sure. Thank you.